Welcome to Beer and Baseball, a Myrtle Beach Pelicans production. I am your host, Adam Dellinger. But before we get to today's pod, here are a few housekeeping notes. First off, this is a new podcast, so the more you share, the more listeners we obtain. Where can you listen, you might ask? On the iHeart Podcast Network and also on the Myrtle Beach Pelicans YouTube channel. Listen, subscribe, review, five stars would be great, and share. That's all we ask. Now, let's go. Welcome to the first ever Beers and Baseball podcast. This is uh, a working title, and you are watching, listening to, I suppose, the quarantine edition. My name is Adam Dellinger, and uh, I have a couple of guests, one I'm meeting for the first time, and one that I've known for a while, and the one that I've known for a while, we're going to start with him, I'll let him introduce himself, it's uh, general manager Ryan Moore from the Myrtle Beach Pelicans. He also thought of the title. What's up, Ryan? Hey, hey Adam. Uh, yeah, Ryan Moore is a name. Uh, disregard the Christian call in the corner of that uh, screen there. I couldn't get my computer to work, so uh, Christian's a <laughs> uh, very, very minor league. Uh, same, same thing with the 30 seconds before talking. It's like uh, we should drink beers while doing this. So, Adam, sorry you don't, you don't have a beer in the office, but uh, we'll, send, we'll send some your way. Okay, wait a minute. Before we move on here, let's, well, I I don't want to jump ahead. Um, I figured that our next, the other person on the podcast with us today, I should say, is uh, if you are a baseball fan, if you're a Myrtle Beach Pelicans fan, you probably don't need an introduction, but I'm going to let him introduce himself as well. And then I want to do a follow-up on the beer thing and the late notification there. So go ahead, man. Yeah, Steve LaRue here, uh, the manager for the the Pelicans. Live from Reno, Nevada, in my guest room, just uh, quarantined up, waiting to get back out on the field. But All right, so we used to drink beer at 10 a.m., so I guess I can I can handle it. Uh, that's called the the West Coast bummer, I guess, man. So let me get this straight. <laughs> Uh, I am at my. I, I host a radio show in Myrtle Beach, and I am the only man in the building. So I'm in the studio. I'm in my office outside of my studio. Ryan is sitting on the couch drinking beer, and Coach is in Reno. Why do I have the short end of the deal here? You got to talk to Jimmy about that one. I don't understand what's going on. And yes, the the beers and baseball title, which I love, and I think uh, the, the title could stick. But frankly, I didn't get the notification that there was a uh, beer involved until literally 30 seconds before I'm signing on the Zoom. Man's got to have some notice if he's going to sneak alcohol into his workplace. Very true. Yeah, I got I got the notice at 9:58. I was already set up. I had to go back downstairs. So I guess that'll be my workout for today. I guess the, uh, the lesson of it all is just make sure you always have beer in the office. That that that's what I would take from this. I should mention this too. It, it, Ryan Moore, his office at the ballpark is of astronomic proportions. I mean, it, it's a top shelf liquor selection on this hand built bar that has to be, I don't know, six and a half, seven feet long. And here's the crazy part too, folks the bar is always open. There's See, no I didn't know. I didn't know. Board. I didn't know he had that because he always comes into my office after the games and steals mine. That's why he always has such a, a large selection of liquor. He drinks everybody else's stuff. The hoarder. Yeah. If, if the coaching staff made its way to the office after the games, we, we'd be replenishing it on a much more. <laughs> <laughs> I think. With, with that said, that's a pretty cool transition here. This is kind of a rough cut deal, and we. Uh, I kicked around the idea or actually was asked about doing a podcast with you guys. And this is not really the way that we had planned on doing the first one of these, obviously. And uh, so with the situation now and baseball kind of on hold, we're all having to get sort of clever and creative and, and, you know, trying to get together and get information out there. With that said, uh, Ryan, I guess I could start with you. You guys, Obviously, right now, we would be, like, in the throes of promotional, you know, baseball time right now. Season, of course, should be underway. We should be celebrating. We should be at the ballpark. Obviously, that's not an option. But you guys are doing some really cool stuff like the uh, like the Thirsty Thursday Netflix party. Yeah, it's – you know, I think it's what, what everyone's doing. You, you, 
you, you want to keep everybody safe and then you want to make sure you're doing the right things for for the fans for for the staff for the community and but at the same time that doesn't mean you know we need to shut down communications with each other and lock ourselves in inside walls and, and not communicate and i think you know that's been the, the great showing of people coming together in, in the ways that they can you know all of us would love to be sitting down at a table uh you know face to face but it doesn't allow for it but this is better than nothing and and that's uh kind of the approach we're taking with our with our staff doing the netflix parties we, we have a text chain going we do a zoom call every day to check in see how everybody's days are going we have everybody working remotely um luckily we we have uh the capabilities to do that here and, and we're fortunate to still uh still be coming in and, and working, just not coming into the office and working. Um, but having fun while, while doing it, we're not trying our best to. Well, with that said, Coach, I, I kind of want to ask you uh, a similar question. What is What would be the mindset that you're in right now this time of year? Like, obviously – you're having to set a new set of goals and, and ideas and we don't really have a start date for baseball right now. What does that do to you and your psyche as far as your preparation is concerned? I mean, for, for me now uh, on the coaching aspect, it, it's not, I don't want to say it, it's a whole lot different for me personally. I think for the player, I could only imagine, I mean, three years ago I was still playing and this time of the year is when you're really starting to ramp up. You're, you're getting ready for that season. You're, on the bubble of making a club or not, you're trying to make that last push. Um, so you're, you're, you're really just starting to get in shape and, and you're, you're hitting your stride. We hadn't even started games on the minor league side down in Arizona yet, which was crazy. So I, I had been out there already since the start of major league camp, but it was like we did all this practice and hadn't even played a game yet. So it was really surreal when we got taken out of there. I mean, I, I got, a, uh, I got an email at like 2 o'clock on March 13th, and I was on a plane by next o'clock back in Reno. Um, so I think at first I don't think we, we really understood the magnitude of what, of what this was and, and how greatly it could affect everything. But when I got on that plane, that was an eerie feeling, man. It really was. Um, anytime – you see professional sports shut down. We haven't seen this before, you know, since a world war or nine 11, but um, I, I just hope everybody's taking the, the right precautions to stay safe so we can all get out and, and live our lives the way that we, we, we want to. I should mention too, uh, that the coach here, by the way, just, Kristen and Ryan can tell you this. I'm huge on titles, and once you've got one, like I'm just calling you whatever that is from there on out. And Fair it enough. feels, re listen, it feels really cool that I, I get to call somebody coach and that they respond to it because uh, it's their actual job. So, with that said, I should mention that uh, you did some considerable service time in the bigs as a catcher in your own right. What would you be doing right now? as a catcher with baseball out, uh, you know, out of service right now to stay ready to go, considering the fact that you don't know when you may get a phone call saying that, Hey, this is when opening day is. No, I mean, that, that's the, that's the other hard thing for these guys right now that there's not a lot of gyms, no gyms are open. There's nowhere for these guys to really stay in shape. So they got to get really creative on their own. Um, and that takes, a, it takes a lot of, takes a lot of discipline to, to you have all these built-in excuses right now to not be able to do things. And on the other side of it, your job is, is depending on this also. So not losing track is the hardest thing. And I guess right now doing whatever you can, I can't imagine um, you can't catch bullpens really. You can't, you can't do any of the things that you need to be able to play or, or be ready to play. Um, and I think that's the biggest challenge. And you see some of these guys on the social media right now, they're getting very creative. I, I saw a video where, a couple guys with the Padres, they wouldn't built their own mound and they're, they're quarantined up in, in Arizona to get Bill and, and they're throwing bullpen to each other. One's a catcher, one's a pitcher. I think you're going to see a lot, a lot of very creative things that these guys are doing, trying to figure out ways to, to stay in shape. And it is a challenge. It's a huge challenge for these guys. 
Just to stay on the topic, too, this is out of flag curiosity, because I'll tell you this also, Coach, uh, and again, Ryan can attest to it, I am a massive, massive baseball fan. Spring training was sort of not quite full stride, but, you know, pretty much there. What do you think this does to somebody that is trying to get the last roster spot on a big league team, and they were going to need those last couple of weeks to be evaluated, and they were starting to see significant more time on the diamond. If you just had to theorize, what is it going to do for those players? I mean, I've been that guy in camp. I can't imagine having having that feeling, putting in all the work in the offseason, getting yourself in that position to to possibly make that club. Um, Mentally, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how you can recover from that right, right away. You know, and like I said, it takes a ton of discipline to be able to, to have the right mindset to keep getting after it. Um, and yeah, I mean, you, you put all that work in for spring training and in the off season, and and you don't know if it's going to ever pay off. <laughs> That's a really tough feeling to to go home with at, at this time. Ryan, I wanted to shift back to you here for a moment, if I could. How how informed are you on the day to days about what baseball is is doing right now, as far as their planning efforts and things like that? As the general manager of of the Pelicans, are are you in meetings daily? Is that an email chain? You're doing these conference calls with the video stuff. Like, what's the deal? Yeah. Uh, a lot of that, um, you know, daily emails are, are coming in from from the league, from from minor league baseball themselves. Uh, a lot of the st- correspondence with Major League Baseball gets funneled through minor league baseball. So we don't have a ton of direct contact with Major League Baseball, uh, but we're we're in constant communications at, in, you know, informal ways, too, of calling uh, the other GMs of other teams of, hey, how, how are you handling this situation? We, we just got th- this question asked. And it, it's a great industry for that collective sharing. And, you know, it's a non-competitive industry. The better all of our teams do, the better the industry does. So we, we, we collaborate a lot. Uh, just yesterday, we had about four people from our staff and four people from the staff of the Daytona Tortugas because they had a, a, an idea and they said, hey, let's, uh, let's hop on, let's grab some beers and, and let's talk it out and come up with a plan. And I think a lot of that's happening all across the country. Um, and, you know, the, the biggest thing is, you know, we got informed of the CDC eight weeks and, you know, we're really in a holding pattern until until we know more information. And, you know, we we all we all want to get back out and open our gates and, and have, have the team here in town. But, you know, we're cognizant and, and in green, an agreement that, you know, it needs to be safe first. And and that's that's what we're trying to do is, you know, what do what are we doing as, as an organization, as a as an industry? to help the country, inform people of information that they need. Because right now, it's less about baseball and it's more about people. And, uh, of course, safety there as well. I did pick up on something you just mentioned, though. You, you got a phone call from another organization, and then the brainstorming session was, hey, let's grab some beer and talk about this. Is that what you said, Ryan? Yes. Yeah, that's the common overriding theme Uh I don't know if you heard the saying, um, and I'm probably going to butcher it a little bit, but quarantine drinking is like airport drinking. If you're there at 8 a.m., it, no one's going to judge you for having a beer. So, You know what? Fair point. But, uh, you know, I'm coming here doing a radio show every day, and the FCC has this, you know, set of rules that they've got to follow. And, frankly, it sucks, dude, because yeah, you guys are having way more fun than I am, too. Howard Stern had a couple of drinks on the air, I would, I would have thought. Howard Stern has a five-year, $500 million contract, and I'm talking into an iPhone 10 right now. I think there's a, a, a massive difference, okay? Uh, with that said, I did want to ask you guys, I thought we could have some fun on the podcast too today and not be super serious and super driven with what's going to happen with baseball. So uh, with that said, I did want to ask uh, one question here that's, sort of specific to baseball. I think everybody keeps making a comparison, and I'll give you guys both a a turn on this because I'd I'd love to hear from both of you. The comparison that people keep making is to that of uh, the events after 9-11 when we sort of stopped 
even if it was momentarily just for a couple of weeks, we sort of stopped and then we got united and, and nobody will ever forget uh, President Bush throwing out the first pitch at Yankee Stadium and the how Jeter called it and he threw a strike and he threw it from up on the bump. And then I specifically remember being in college and I'm a Braves fan, but it's not really a, a secret if you know me, but I remember the Braves played the Mets at Shea. They were in the middle of a series when I uh, got held up and the Braves lost that game, but it's the only time we ever pulled for the Mets. I think with sports on hold, do you guys both believe that baseball has a chance when we come out of this thing to be the thing that's like, oh, look, we're America, we kick ass and baseball's back? I hope so. I mean, I, I don't see why not. People are going to want to get out. They're going to want to they're going to want to go see other people again. I mean, it's crazy. Um, even right now, back home here, anytime I go out of the house, there's there's people everywhere. And, and all of a sudden, I'm, I've met my neighbors for the first time in 10 years. Like, it's unbelievable. So I, I right. hope that, that, that baseball is the thing. You know, go grab a beer, have a dog, watch a game, you know, good company. I, I hope that, that people aren't afraid to come out at the end of this. Sure. Yeah, I, I – and I think, uh, you know, I agree, I agree with Steve. And, you know, if you look back, 9-11 you know, is a great example. And there's a lot of other examples of, you know, natural disasters coming into areas and, and sports being that unifying bond that, that brings people back together. Um, you know, certainly there's going to be, be a time frame for, for comfort levels to get back to, to where they are. But I, I ultimately think, you know, baseball will be what brings this country back together just in, in the timing standpoint and, it, it'll be a rallying cry. Um, it'll it'll be it'll show the strength of our country, uh, our resiliency, and you know we're we're already talking about you know we don't know when opening day is, but we know we're gonna have have an opening day, and we're expecting it to be the best opening day we've ever had. And I, I think the enthusiasm to to get out and celebrate and be be a part of the community and see other people, uh, I think that that will that human will is gonna override. Um, anything else that prevents people from coming back together? It, it, we're we're excited for it, looking forward to it. Don't just don't know when it is. Well, one thing that I've noticed that I find really ironic is how frustrated people get. And again, I'm going to speak in generalizations here, and I, it's not intended to be politically correct or whatever the opposite of that is either. I'm just making generalized statements. I believe that people over the course of the last 10 or 15 years have become utterly frustrated with being in crowds of other people. They don't want to be around them at all. And it's funny how throughout this whole thing, all we're talking about is when can we all get back together? Like it's the craziest thing. to me. It's wild. Like even people that want to go to work now, Three yeah, weeks ago, yeah. nobody wanted to work. Now everybody wants to go to work. <laughs> hey, I want to go to Ryan's work. Like, that's what I want to do. Yeah. I definitely that's, picked the, the wrong field. This is my hurricane bunker. Thing, I figured. Things go bet down. I could, I could live here for a couple months, I think. What are you guys streaming at home? What are you doing at home? You're stuck. You can't really do anything. So are you you're watching television? What's the deal? I, I'm a uh, major thing. Two-year-old two and a uh, eight-month-old. So um, I'm, I'm streaming across the house after them more so than sitting on the couch watching anything streaming at this point. Dude, I completely understand. Like, my boss just asked me, like, maybe a couple hours ago, he was like, and obviously Tiger King, we're, we're going to come back, Coach. But um, he asked me what I was streaming, and I'm like, dude, I've got a four-year-old daughter. You know what I watched last night? I watched the, this, like, really – the Cat in the Hat movie with Mike Myers is the Cat in the Hat. It's like the movie ever, and I watched it back to back last night. Two times in a row, I watched it last night. Oh man, that's yeah. dang. Nemo. Nemo's the popular one at the moment. Um, I think that that's been played back to back for for days now. I, that one's not a bad one. There's a lot worse ones out there. I, I, I'm starting to really enjoy it kind of finding the inner story within the story after seeing it 17 times in a row you start to pick up on things listen dude there's nothing bad on disney plus once you get sucked over into the outskirts of the family section on netflix that's when you run into the mike myers as the cat in the hat with alec baldwin and kelly preston and just to, to tell you how bad the movie is you know has a who has a pretty significant role near the end of the movie paris hilton bro that's when you know you're working with some garbage. 
Oh my God! Which, which speaking of coaches in uh, Reno, he may actually run into Paris Hilton at the Kroger or something like I don't know. Oh yeah, we don't have Kroger. <laughs> you got to go to the Ra- the Rayleys. We have Rayleys. <laughs> Rayleys. That's yeah. a cold conversation for another time too. Like, what's your region specific grocery store? Sure. Absolutely. Publix. We don't have Publix. I miss Pub Subs. I love going to Publix and getting a sub. I can't do that now. That's, what, that's, what was, that's actually what I was looking forward to getting to Myrtle Beach. Get a, get a sandwich at Publix. <laughs> it's the little things in life at this point. Right. I lived in San Antonio for a little while, and they literally have one grocery store. It's called H-E-B. Like, it's a H-E-B, and it's all they have. There's nothing else. Like, if you don't want to shop at H-E-B, you're going to starve because there is nothing else. There's no other choices. I wanted to get back home where there's Lowe's and Food Line. And food, again, I don't want to do like a whole four minutes on grocery stores uh, that are regionally specific. Uh, what, where are you at on Tiger King, Coach? I'm done. Finished it in a day. What'd you think? Um, confusing. I want I want Ryan to hook me up. I want to go over to that place in Myrtle. Yeah. Check hey, out. I, got, I, I, have huh? you have I have an in. You have an in? I have an in. All right. Do you? We, yeah. We'll, can we do one of those? You know what we ought to do? We ought to do we the go there and then do a pod place. after it. Right. That's the idea. We do the next podcast at Myrtle Beach Safari. In, inside the lion's <laughs> cage. Just holding some cubs? <laughs> inside, the, inside the house, too, of the harem that, that he's running. Like, I don't. Can I, I say that? that? I don't know that I want to go in those. <laughs> is that, is that against the rules? So I'm doing this deal right now where I'm doing a contest on the air, and um, people always talk about March Madness, and obviously we missed the NCAA tournament. But March Madness is great, but the Final Four is in April. Like, it's always been in April. It's always been like I've never understood why April gets left out because that's when we play the national championship game. With that said, I'm doing a Final Four – Tiger King, who's craziest? So, who's the craziest person on the entire docu series? The, the craziest person. It's got to be one of the husbands. CB. To, to me, it's Jeff Lowe or Carol Baskin. Yeah, but but what about what about the two husbands that that are both straight? But I mean, those guys are pretty whacked out. I think that the one husband right now, the young one, apparently on his Instagram, he's all about women right now. So no, I guess they, after they, they, weren't, weren't both of them straight? Yeah, both of them were straight. I think yeah, initially those guys had to be the most whacked out dudes ever. But but the one guy is all the way straight now. Like the the young guy, he decided that after he didn't do anymore and live on a tiger preserve in Oklahoma or whatever. He was like, oh my gosh, there's other things in the world. And now he's all in on Instagram looking for love. DM him, drop him one. You can find him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find him, yeah. What a guy. I, I'd go Carol Baskin, hands down. No no question in my mind. Carol Baskin. I just, or, I don't, I don't always like the obvious answer. You gotta, I mean, you gotta, yeah, those guys are whacked out. That's the layup. Is, I gotta, I gotta get another out. one of my beers. It, they're not very far from me. Wait, what are you drinking? What is that? This that is looks a, like a Michelada. It's a it's a spiked agua fresca. Oh, it's kind that's of. That's not a beer. That's a seltzer. No, it's not a seltzer. It's a it's a agua fresca. There's a there's a there's a, there's a nuance. There's a difference. Um, Dude, does, that's like that's literally seltzer in Spanish or something. Like I don't know. <laughs> it, it tastes it's, a little different. It tastes. It does have like a beer a beer undertone, but it does. Uh, it's kind of the blend between the two. I just know. because you're having a, a, a Latin white claw doesn't make it not a seltzer, bro. <laughs> I'm the tough brother. This was what left over from last season. Oh, well, listen, I, I get the idea because I'm not downloading a podcast called Baseball and Seltzer. Like, I'm just – there's no way. I can't get behind that. Here's the deal about Carol Baskin. Here's my theory. She's not crazy at all. As a matter of fact, she's running the best racket of all time. I'm going to do the same thing that I'm going to get mad about other people doing but call mine a sanctuary. Charge the same rate for everybody else to come to my deal. Get the other people closed down or even worse, get PETA after them. That's even worse than being closed down. 
because they'll dump buckets of blood on your gate and you know show up naked and stuff. Get one <laughs> of the owners, get one of the owners thrown in prison, literally thrown in prison, and then guess what you've got? Monopoly on the whole deal. Crazy or legitimate business person. I think I mean that now when you put it that way, you gotta give her a little credit. And Dude, got rid of her me, first husband without a trace. They just uh, the got the money. Back up. The, the did she? Did she? Kind of did she kill him? Oh yeah, yeah. Had to have. Come on. Sardine oil for days, and and then her brother just happened to find her that same night, who was a cop or a sheriff, wandering the streets at three a.m. Mm -hmm. if, if she was going to Kroger. Yeah, Kroger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was going to Kroger to get Latin seltzers late at night. That's what was happening. Uh, is if you're the cops, if you're the local cops, and there is a missing persons complaint filed or whatever, and you show up, and the guy that's missing is married to a lady that owns like 300 tigers, isn't your first inclination to, I think we're going to need to look out back? Well, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> isn't that the thing? Well, anybody that has that many cats in general, I don't care if they're tigers or, or just a house cat. Like, that's a crazy person. <laughs> well, the hoarders would back you up on that because they'll do the hoarders <laughs> deal where, like, there will be some lady, you know, in some outskirt city in Utah. And they find, like, oh, my gosh, there's three dead rats in the freezer and she's got, like, 90 kittens and, you know. There's like babies in the disposal and stuff. It always gets kind of weird when, with the cat people. But with that said, I've always been a firm believer in the exotic pet world just being strange to begin with. Like if I come over to your dude, if I come to your house and like your sunroom's been converted into this place to keep two large blue McCalls, like I, I probably ain't hanging with you no more. You know what I mean? Oh, I do absolutely. <laughs> No, like, like somebody has like a lion in their backyard. I'm not probably <laughs> that. That's been my thing. Aren't we all about the same? Coach, how old are you? Are you 35? I'm 35, yeah. Yeah, 35. And Ryan and I are the same age. I remember as a kid, like before we were really, like the government just wasn't really regulating things yet. Right. And, and I remember you could go to like the downtown pet store and there'd be like an alligator this long in an aquarium. Does anybody remember that? I, at the I moment, remember I, I went to a high school party once and, and it was from a different school. I knew, like, I don't know how I ended up at this house, but the people had a bear. They had a bear as a pet. <laughs> <laughs> like caged yes. up. Parents are gone. The bear, all these high school kids, booze are flowing. I, I, I don't know how the night ended, but I, I got out of there, I think. This what is what I'm out telling of, you. the bear gets out of the high school? Party? Parents are gone. That, like, ooh. I, this is a true I story, don't. dude. I, I dated a girl one time that went to school at uh, at Campbell. I don't know if anybody knows where Campbell is. a pharmacy <laughs> school in North Carolina. And when I say I dated her, I mean I went out with her like two times. All right? The first time was like a blind date. It was like a setup deal. We went like bowling or like to a bar or something afterwards. And then uh, like I took her back home and that was like the end of that. And this is like this is 15 years ago or something. The second time she had a death in her family, which completely expedited the meeting of the parents. You know what I'm saying? Because like I really like this girl and it's cool and but I'm not meeting her mom and dad for a while but then like her great uncle dies or something and so like now I'm meeting the parents like pretty early on go over there four or five birds dude and that was the end of it that was the end of the whole thing that's yeah, like what you want a story. bird in your house <laughs> that's I'm what I'm saying that. you walked in and it was immediately like it's like, you know that weird thing you got to do when you meet somebody's parents for the first time. So I roll up in there and I'm like, hi, you know, Mr. Johnson or whatever. Uh, sorry about your loss. Um, Adam, it's nice to meet you. And then it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, 
<laughs> and you're like in the house and it's like you're trying to have a conversation and somebody's died, but you're really just like looking around. Is that like a cockatiel or something? Like <laughs> what is uh what is happening? I've always kind of believed that. I always wondered what happened to all those alligators at the mall pet stores, too. You know what they sell here? You know what they sell here, coach? What? We got a flea market on 17, man. It's like right next to a food line in Surfside. They sell these, like, it's like a little marsupial that flies. It's called a sugar glider. You can buy it for like 40 bucks. What is it? What is it supposed to do? Why do you want one? No, no, no. It's an exotic. You don't want it. But there's some weird cats out there that do, bro. It's uh, it's about this big. <laughs> and it's it's like, it looks like, it looks like a bat. But it doesn't fly. It just leaps from objects in your home and, and glides around. And people buy them. I know three or four people that own them, bro. Where, where do they? Where do they like, take a? Sh- wherever they are, man, because they're a pet. You know. Oh, you just are, like just like wherever they're hanging. They're out. just jumping around from like the dresser to the bed, and they. Where, how do you clean up after them? I don't. I don't get it. Same thing with a dog, bro. Yo, Ryan, you got pets. I got two big dogs, no weird animals, no hermit crabs. That's where I thought you were going with on uh, talking about Myrtle Beach exotic animals. You can buy them in like every corner, uh, free if you buy like a hemp necklace or something too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got any purchase of three ninety nine or more. That you <laughs> <mention> <laughs> <my> <laughs> okay. Two for one. Last year vacation, but it's free. Uh, yeah, I got a hundred twenty pound golden retriever. Uh, just a wide-bodied mess, and then I got a uh, lab greyhound mix. So two dogs. That's it. We got a heartbeat limit in our house. We're at six. That's the capacity of, of the heartbeat limit. So I'm a two dogger. I'm one a two dogger. One more in, that means one has to go out. So and that's gonna be you, unfortunately. I am. I'm the first dog. <laughs> oh, where are you at, Coach? You a pet man? I got. I have a. I have a little pit bull. One year old. One year old pit bull that uh, we rescued from the uh, the humane society about a year ago. So let's play fantasy. Here's here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna play fantasy fantasy life exotic pit game. And I just made it up. And the title. We'll we'll explore the title some more. Who is the who is the all time flashiest coach of any sport that's made a whole bunch of money. I'm going to throw my nod to Pat Riley. I'm going to say Pat Riley is the flashiest and one of the richest coaches. I may be wrong. Mike Dick is probably in there too. I don't know if baseball's really had a dude that's sort of flashy and out there like that. I mean, you got Dusty Baker. Right, maybe you're right, Dusty Baker, maybe Dusty Billy Baker Martin back the in the day. Fans. He's always got his he's got his good shades on. Toothpick. All right, all right. So here's how the game works. Let's say that your career trajectory follows that path. And you're coaching in the bigs and you're you're young, 51 years old, and you've got four World Series rings. And let's say you've done it with two different teams. Does that always elevate you? Sure. You're up here with it. You've got endorsement deals because you're ultra likable. And so they're like, oh, well, this guy, you're talking about, you know, Bridgestone golf balls. And you're talking about like, you know, Goodyear tires, bro. You're, you're hawking everything on TV. You've got copper bracelets, nose hair trimmers like far. They've given you a ton of money. All right. Okay. What's your exotic pet? Oof. <clears throat> I'm gonna get like a I'm gonna get like a dolphin, like a dolphin tank or something. You know? Like a saltwater, a big ass saltwater pool. You can like swim with the dolphins from there, right? Because then I got a pool and I've got dolphins. It's not gonna hurt you. You chose to feed us. them in the morning, get up at five, go for a swim with them, feed them some yeah, perfect. Dolphins. Uh-huh. Okay. Dolphin, I dig it, dude. You went the porpoise route. I wasn't expecting it. A real curveball. I like it. Uh, Ryan, same question, except your fantasy scenario is a little bit different. I'm going to paint it for you. All right. All of a sudden, the Cubs are like, you know what? Theo just called us. 
and he doesn't want to do this at all anymore. He, he's tired of baseball altogether, and he is actually moving to Silicon Valley, and he is going to become like a tech mogul or something, which I'm pretty sure Theo could probably navigate if he wanted to. With that said, they're like, we got this dude in Myrtle Beach. His name's Ryan Moore. He's an innovative thought starter. He is the man with the plan. He knows personnel. He knows promotions. He knows it all. Boom, you're fast-tracked. You're in. Next thing you know, you've made like $330 million. Actually, you guys are hawking the same products in the same commercials. It's like a, you've got the first ever GM TV endorsement deal, bro. What's your what's your pit? I, I, I'm i going to go with Steve's route because I was like, oh, man, I'm glad you didn't, you didn't ask me first because I wouldn't have a clue. But you know Gabby over there at Ripley's Aquarium? Yeah. I want I want that big old sea turtle uh, coming coming around too. I'm gonna get one of those big things. <laughs> Here's the only thing about the about Ripley's Aquarium in Myrtle Beach. If you got the sea turtle, that would be awesome because that would mean I would actually have a chance to see it. Because every time I show up, it's pretending to be a rock in the dark somewhere, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> every single time. I have. All right. My kid, my kid loves that Ripley's Aquarium, and you know you got to go down that moving people belt and. Like, it's hard to find Gabby sometimes. And my kid is, I got to find Gabby. I got to find Gabby. So if we go through it, it's not like you can walk back. You have to go back mm-hmm. around the whole thing. We've gone through that lap four or five times till we've seen Gabby. Luckily, I got the book. I pointed out a rock and been like, oh, there's Gabby. She's sleeping. Let's go. <laughs> the old tactic to get to, to move on to the, the next thing. Luckily, they've got a button that powers a conveyor belt. Uh, I should say, I have given thought to this scenario a lot, all right? So let's say my career takes the exact opposite path that it's taken now, and I finally find some success in my life. And all of a sudden, I have uh, yielded a great fortune to myself, and I'm now worth $600 million. Do you know what I'm buying? What? You want me to guess? Take a guess. You're not going to get it. Uh, Like. Like, wouldn't it be crazy to have like a silverback gorilla in your backyard, like something like that? Listen, I've thought about going the silverback gorilla route many times, many times, but they're climbers, so you got to be careful. <laughs> I, I've chosen to go. In, I've chosen to go another route. Okay, you guys remember the scene when they get to Jurassic Park and they're bolted into the the chairs and it's like the automated tour of the facility. Yeah, yeah, And they show them the little video and they're drilling into the amber to the fly and then there's a little guy he's like, that old DNA. There is no way we haven't reached that technology now. There's no way we're not there. My exotic pet is I'm bringing something back from like 300 million years ago. Okay, question. You got six hundred million. How much are you willing to pay for that thing? Five hundred ninety million. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen. How? What's the ballerest thing you can do to be like, man? Did you see that dude over there ball a dolphin? Yeah. Well, did you hear his boss just got a sea turtle? Well, did y'all hear about that radio guy that just brought the dodo back to extinction? <laughs> yeah. Hey, man. I didn't know you were into big cats. What is that? Like a puma? No, nah, man, that's a saber-toothed tiger named <laughs> Sheila. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Oh, uh, Sheila. With that said, too, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you this, Coach, too, uh, in all seriousness here. I don't know where we're at on time or if this is even working, but I'm having a really good time, so I appreciate you guys. Uh, yeah. um, when you – you're from Vegas – or, well, you're Reno, from, Northern Nevada. Yeah, you're from Reno. You're from Nevada. You obviously were a baseball fan, but I've talked to Ryan about this before, too, and, and other players. Once you reach the level where you're playing baseball and all of a sudden you, you're playing better talent and better talent and better talent, and then it's working out and you can sort of tell that maybe you have a chance to make a profession out of playing baseball. Do you are you still a fan of a particular team at that point, or does baseball become the thing that you're more into? I'm talking about like 20 year old you. Yeah, I mean, I I was at that point just a fan. I was a fan of the game. I had players that I wanted to because I was a fan of so many players. There wasn't a team anywhere. I grew up a Giants fan, being from this area. San Francisco's three hours away, so Matt Williams was always my favorite player growing up. Oh, but yeah. once I 
once I started uh, getting better and, and really like studying the game, you know, I, anytime a ball game, I, w- I would watch the Braves on TBS when I'd get home and the, the Cubs would always be on on a day game. So I, I would watch the Cubs, the Braves, the Giants are always on at night, the Oakland A's are always on. And I just had players from all the teams that I like to like to watch. And, and at that time, you know, you go out in the backyard and try to emulate them. So I don't know that the kids do that as much anymore. Um, everything is so like lesson based and everything. But no, I was just a fan of the game and I, I continue to do that. Obviously, I want the Cubs to, to win as many games as, as they can. Um, but and, and I want to keep getting players better. I think, I think that's the biggest thing. Well, part of the problem, too, about not knowing if kids do that anymore, here's the problem. And you, you guys can both comment on this, too. Again, we're all the same age. When I was growing up, if you had a broomstick and you couldn't emulate 20 different stances and swings from either side of the plate, then you just weren't paying attention. Part of the problem now, and it may be an analytics issue now, too, we don't got great stances anymore. Who's got a griffy waggle? Who's doing the weird stuff that Craig Council would show up with every year? Or like Jay Buhner, who's the last guy that showed up and just faced the pitcher with the bat sitting on their shoulder? Like, it's not a thing anymore. Mike Trout leaps and bounds better than any player in baseball dude's got literally generic stance number seven or whatever like he's got the stance that every single little league coach teaches their teaches their kid to have that's the issue yeah i mean i i do think to a to a point with these young kids especially when you're trying to learn how to play the game like it's already hard enough <laughs> i i can't expect a seven-year-old to swing like mike trout are you kidding me like physically, he can't do it yet. He's, his physicality isn't there to be able to do it. Um, I think we're taking a lot of the the fun. Like a lot of kids don't even play little league anymore. They go play this travel ball, and, and it's coached by who they take lessons from, who's teaching them how to swing like Mike Trout. And I'm sorry, there's only one of those guys. I didn't want that to be a, a bashing of Mike Trout either. So if you're not, thinking not that that's all. What, no, it's not. I mean, no, not, not you, me. Players. I just, yeah, I, I just didn't want to make it sound like I was bashing. You just that's praising not, the hardcore. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous when you're trying to make a ten year old and and you think that he's going to be Mike Trout. Like, <laughs> major league players are the top one percent in the world, and Mike Trout is the best of all of them. Like. <laughs> Well, you know what? Let's talk about that for a minute, too, especially since you're a coach and you're more in tune with, especially at the level that you're coaching at, because you're dealing with a lot of kids. And I'm not using that as a derogatory way. I'm just saying you're dealing with, you've got teenagers that you've got to deal with on a lot of occasions. Now, with that uh, said, how low of a level, I guess, how young of an age is a better term to put that, are analytics being practiced? Are we doing are we doing exit velocity and launch angle with twelve year olds now? Is that a thing? I think I think that that turns into like that fine line that that you're starting to draw is people are understanding that they can make money off of that stuff if they understand the numbers, but that doesn't make you a good baseball coach. I don't I don't think the numbers for a twelve year old. What does it matter? I don't I don't I think we do do that a little bit and probably a little bit too much. Um, and I, I think that there's a ton of value in a lot of these analytics. There, there really is. If you can deliver the message to the player to where he can understand it and understand how it applies to his game. Um, I don't think a 12 year old is in any position to number one, be able to understand it. And number two, be able to apply it to his own game. I mean, this kid's just learning how his body's working. Like let him just go play. Um, so, yeah, it's a fine line, and I, I think that there are some very good people out there that are doing a lot of really good things as far as that's concerned and on the amateur side as well. But there also are some people, I think, that are out there doing it for the wrong reason. And it's not about the kids. It's about the paycheck, and, and I, I have a problem with that. No, I, you know, I think a lot of people echo that as well. And it's not every day that I get to sit in my office in the middle of the afternoon and talk to a guy that coaches baseball. Another guy's the general manager of, for a ball team. And then uh, that same coach there played big league baseball. Tim Kirchin, like for like the last 25 years, has been saying that the hardest thing to do in any sport is to hit a major league fastball. And I take umbrance with that. And I was going to ask you about it, too. 
I think that hitting a big league fastball is probably like the third or fourth hardest thing to do in all the sports because I feel like a really nasty slider is like number one on the list. And I, I wanted to ask you, who's the toughest person that you ever faced? Not only that, who's the best player that you were ever on the field with? Like a time when you saw somebody and you were like, I don't know if I can do that. Oh man, I mean, <laughs> I had a lot of those moments. The list was long for that one. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, no, I mean, I the list was long. <laughs> oh man, yeah. Um, best pitcher I ever faced, Mariano Rivera. Um, what did that you do? Was, huh? What did you do on him? I walked. You walked. I walked. He he broke my bat twice though. I had to go. I was on my third bat by the time I finally walked. <laughs> he ran he ran that fastball in on your hands that cutter, he, that cutter? You couldn't, yeah. see <laughs> you couldn't see it you couldn't see it didn't know when it was gonna cut um yeah so that, that was the toughest guy i ever faced shoot best player i mean the first time that when, when i was when i was coming up i came up with the pirates the first time that i was on a field with somebody and i absolutely knew that he was going to be a superstar was when i played with andrew mccutcheon coming up with the pirates mm -hmm. it was like he was 18 years old and he was the best player on the field with a bunch of guys that had just you know they're 22 they're four years older than him and you think like physically how how much bigger and stronger guys get in those four years like when you're a senior in high school to when you're a senior in college you, you you put some some pounds on and this guy was 18 out of high school he's the best player on the field um best major league player i ever played with on the same team i mean chase chase utley mm, chase. chase utley's up there i played with roy halliday um i was forced I, I played with with that those guys in philly they were on the back end of that that world series team but i mean adrian beltre Mm -hmm. Adrian Beltre is probably the best player I've ever, most consistent best player I've ever seen. Michael Young, guys like that, and and just the consistency that was something that I always really, uh, I was jealous of them for. Like, how do you, how do you find it every day? Every day you find it, and it was, those are the guys you look at and you're like, man, <laughs> how come I can't do that? I saw Adrian Beltre play uh, on those. Phillies teams at Turner a couple of times, and I always thought Adrian Beltre, even when he was on those Phillies teams, was really like 58 years old, and like we just didn't really know what was happening there, but he hit the baseball as hard as anybody I've ever seen hit a baseball in person. And as consistently, like, right. it was, it's just crazy. Um, I was fortunate enough in 2017, I was I was with the Rangers. Uh, that was my last year playing. I was in camp with them, and I ended up retiring at the end of camp and, and worked for them that year. So I got to work in Dallas. So I was there the year that he got his 3,000th hit. Um, just watching that guy go about his business every day was unbelievable. And it's something hey, that – go ahead. No, I was just going to say I'm pretty sure that Beltre – Adrian Beltre played third for those Rangers teams – from what seemed like 1978 to like 2006 or something. I know, like and he played every day, and he was yeah. such a good teammate. Um, man, to me, he was he was the best player I've ever seen. Ugliest uniform you ever had to put on? Oof, probably one from last year. No, There's no I mean, way. I knew you were going to say that. No, you know what? We go in a little Richmond, Rich, Richmond, Virginia on Sundays. They would make us wear waffle jerseys. <laughs> thing looked like a waffle. It was called brunch and baseball, and you'd have to wear a waffle. You had to dress up like a waffle on Sundays. <laughs> day game, day game, Richmond, Virginia, hundred degrees. Dress me up like a waffle party. Shout out the party. Yeah. Hey Ryan, I, I would complain to him all the time about those things. He finally we, got have, <laughs> we have a little more time to plan since we don't know when baseball is going to start. Any chance we can do a Sunday breakfast promotion and maybe have like a sunny side up? You need to just do that somewhere. Might as well. Chicken and waffles. We'll make it a little more southern. Yeah. <laughs> make the top of the hat look like an over easy egg. <laughs> I just, uh, <laughs> to come back to that question though, like I think I, Ryan and I have talked about this before. It, it, that 
like I, growing up where I did and watching the Braves all the time, the Braves and the Cubs. See, that's the only teams I watch because WGN, obviously, that you know, they don't play any night games to speak of. So you get home from school and Harry Carey's yep. calling the game, and it was those uh, Shawan Dunstan teams and Ryan Sandberg and Greg Maddox and, and that whole deal. And uh, shout out Andre Dawson, used to like watching the Hulk play. And then with my dad, obviously, we grew up Braves fans. We watched the Braves on TBS at night. And because of that, like, I always thought growing up, you know, every kid's dreams to be a big league player. Like, there's no way I'd play for the Mets or the Phillies. Like, that's just not going to happen. Like, I'm not signing with them. I'm not getting drafted by them. And it's weird to talk to people that actually played, and they're just like, no, none of that shit matters to you. <laughs> yeah, when they throw that check in front of you, you don't care what the – you don't care what logo it is. <laughs> That's the thing about you getting that Goodyear endorsement in the future, leading to your exotic pet <laughs> right. collection. You might actually have, you know, Michelin's on your car, but it doesn't matter. You're taking good. You just need that dolphin pool. I'm just working for that <laughs> dolphin pool. <laughs> Ryan, am I leaving anything out here? You guys not ready to call it a wrap? No, you. I. I think. I think. Uh... You should sh uh, share the story. I, you, you talked about how much of a baseball fan you are. I, I think you should talk about the story of uh, when uh, we saw each other at the CCMF last year, and I, I pointed out to Johnny Damon was standing up oh, on top geez. of the, the VIP bar, and I and Adam, being a big baseball fan, he goes, "Oh, I'm, I'm going after him." And I watch Adam runs through this bar, runs up the stairs, and Johnny's got a big old white cowboy hat on. And I just saw Adam stand next to head. It had to be an hour and a half. <laughs> I couldn't talk to him. So uh, it, uh, Ryan is like the most nonchalant ever. As a matter of fact, he looks exactly like he does now, wearing a button up, a Pelican's hat, and drinking a beer. And he just like sort of <laughs> casually points up to this rooftop bar. He says, Hey, you see that guy up there? That's Johnny Damon. And I look up and I say, God, Holy shit, that's the caveman. I, I got to get up there. <laughs> <laughs> and so I do. I take off and I run up there and I stand a really awkward, non-socially distanced two and a half feet away from this man who was just standing there. And I stood there forever because I'm like, well, what do, what do you say to Johnny Damon? Oh, hey, man, really big fan. You're a great, at, you're a great lead off. Ask him about side. a shampoo. Right. What kind of shampoo he wears. Well, Johnny Damon... <laughs> I, I always enjoyed watching Johnny Damon play because I think that Johnny Damon was ahead of his time. Like if Johnny Damon, well, behind his time, I should say, like Johnny Damon played on up into the beginning of analytics. And really, if Johnny Damon would have been around from 1977 through 1990 or something, we're slapping the ball around. And I mean, because he was essentially – he was a version of Wade Boggs, not as talented, but he could hit the ball the other way. He could use the green monster when played in balls, and he could steal bases. A below average arm, but he covered a lot of ground in center. And I was mesmerized that he's in the same place as me. And I stand there forever, and then here comes Ryan uh, up to the rooftop bar, and he's like, what are you doing? Hell, I'm, uh, I'm looking at Johnny Damon from two and a half feet away. I'm waiting on him. <laughs> waiting to say something to him and so basically ryan had to hold my hand and walk over and ignite the conversation that i had with johnny damon which i will say i went out of the box with what i asked him about and i think he was pleasantly surprised that anybody remembered it i'll see if you remember this uh, also coach so i think that it was between that red sox run that started when uh it started when aaron boone hit the home run the alcs that was 2003. Yeah. They won in 04 and they won in 07, but it was somewhere in that window. They were playing. I was watching on this and I had extra innings at my, uh, I think I was living my parents' in, And I had extra innings there and I was watching the, the Red Sox play. And I do not remember who they were playing, but I remember that they were at home. And somebody hit one into the gap uh, out in left center into that weird crevice where the green monster ends and it seems to be like, 5,074 feet to the corner where the green monster is back there. Johnny Damon goes back and, and cuts the ball off, fields it pretty well right before the warning track and throws maybe the best throw he ever made in his career that's going to be a strike into whoever's playing shortstop, I believe Orlando Cabrera. Orlando Cabrera. For some, 
Yeah, for some odd reason, though, Manny Ramirez, who had dove for a ball in like eight seasons, dives and cuts, cuts it off. off the cutoff throw <laughs> and turns around and he gets up off the ground, turns around, heaves this ball into the sky. And it was the best defensive play Manny Ramirez ever made ever in his made. career. And it was the most boneheaded play ever. And I asked Johnny Damon, I said, hey, man, do you remember that? He's like, oh, yeah, I remember it. And I asked him, what was Manny Ramirez doing? And Johnny Damon commenced to tell me the story that he asked him about it over and over. And Manny's answer was always, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm not really sure what I was doing. Do you remember that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I remember watching that game and, and being like, what in the actual just happened? Like, what? The best defensive play Manny Ramirez ever made in his entire career was cutting yeah. off that strike. But, yes, wow. that, was a, that was a story from the CCMF here, the Carolina Country Music Fest here in Myrtle Beach. Did, have you been to that event? No, we have to go on the road for that. Ryan doesn't let us play. Oh, good, good, good news, Steve. Uh, yeah, tell him, Ryan. They postponed it. Uh, Adam, you probably know the dates. It's like mid-September. so Se Ooh. September 17th through the 20th, dude. I'll be there. If we're in town, yeah. Yeah, it, absolutely. Good likelihood. Cool. All right, here's a, here's a decent way that we can wrap up our first podcast. And I know it's been kind of like rough and disjointed, but I had a really good time, guys. If we all go to the CCMF together here in Myrtle Beach, I want you to all name one random big league ball player that you hope to run into. Not a superstar, just a big leaguer from about 2000 to to 2012 that you hope to run into at the rooftop bar. We'll start with you, Coach. Mike Napoli. Mike Napoli, great choice. Ryan, where are you at on this one? I, I don't know. Um, grew up a big Yankees fan, so trying to think back on those those years. You know, Jeter's the obviously quick, quick easy answer, but um, – But he's not going to be fun to party with. Oh, no, he's not going to be fun no. to party with. I'm trying to – what, what was our boy down? Oh, uh, Ugla. I want to run into Ugla because I think we'd have the best time. <laughs> I'm pretty positive Dan Ugla. Dan Ugla did some serviceable time in Atlanta, too, and I could never figure out why he was the only player since Mantle's, like, 61 season that ordered the jerseys with this sleeve. Like, I'm going to play with this sleeve jersey. <laughs> also, also, too, Shout out to Dan Ugla for really getting ahead of those analytics and going home run or strikeout for his entire career. Hey, he got paid. <laughs> he got he could get a dolphin. He could get a dolphin pool. I, Dan <laughs> Ugla, Dan Ugla's probably the only guy that can hit a golf ball as far as Mike Trout and Top Golf too. <laughs> uh, get on that. All right, so I'm going to go a way outside the box here, and I hope to have a beer at the CCMF this year with Placid Oklahoma. Maybe out there on I the played with Placido. Hey, is he cool? Great dude. Yeah, Great I, dude. Well, I want to change it to somebody that you don't know. Uh, oh, Stephen Brandon. Can, can I do Brandon Inge? Oh, yeah, he'd be fun. <laughs> Brandon Inge. Uh, all right, guys. Hey, listen, man. This was a blast. I don't know when we're going to do the next one. But, yeah, we uh, should run it back sometime. For sure. I'd be more than happy to do it, uh, you know, whenever we can. And we'll get this stuff up and post it where you guys can find it. Hopefully, we didn't get too out of control with the content or the language, but I did have a blast, guys. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, 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 Paul, and beers. Thanks, Adam. Cool. Thanks, Steve. And thanks, guys. For more beer and baseball, subscribe to our podcast and the Myrtle Beach Pelicans YouTube channel. You can also follow the Myrtle Beach Pelicans on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Until next time, cheers!